Okay, well, we concluded uh, chapter one uh, in our last Bible study uh, where Paul established that the society there and the city of Rome was, uh, yes, it was well-educated. Yes, they were well-cultured, um, but there was this church, this church congregation that was there in the midst of this part of the, the Roman Empire. And within that society, they had access to essentially every kind of evil. Uh, the end of chapter one concludes with some of their vices, uh, some of the society's vices, some of the things that the church members were trying to come out of. Um, and, and so Paul concludes chapter one with essentially there's all these evils, there's all these vices, there's all these human tendencies. Uh, and we as church members need to be careful that we're setting those things uh, to the side. And as we come now into chapter two, uh, we have three different sections here in chapter two. Um, the first section of chapter two, two deals with judgment. Um, and initially it's the improper judgments that we as humans can make, but the section concludes with the absolute perfect uh, righteous judgments of God. So uh, the, 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 first, the first section here of chapter two is the impartial judgment of God. Uh, the second section begins in verse 12. Uh, and in verse 12, the apostle Paul begins to talk about how moral obligation is universal. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a moral obligation that we have as humans to live a certain way of life. Uh, and so we, it's, it's easy for us to step back and say, oh, that person's not being called, or they, they live over in that remote part of the world. Uh, they've never seen a Bible. They've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so therefore maybe God judges them a little bit differently. Well, Paul addresses that uh, in the second section uh, from verses 12 through 16. Uh, where he talks about essentially that moral obligation is universal and there is a universal level of expectation that God has on humanity. Uh, beginning in verse 17 through the end of the chapter then um, is the third section. Uh, and this is where Paul uh, essentially describes how the Jews are just as guilty as the Gentiles. Uh, and the, the, the beauty here of chapter two is that uh, all three of these sections really dovetail together. Uh, you'll see, hence, once we discuss and complete the first section on the righteous judgments of God and how, uh, what, how impartial judgments is not something we should be doing, God certainly never does. Um, but, but you'll see that concept of judgments even come back through into section two about the moral standards uh, that, that all the world should practice and be exposed to, as well as when we begin to touch a little bit on the third section, uh, we'll see some of those judgment concepts come back around as well. Um, so I, I wanna begin with, um, actually not in the book of Romans, um, let's begin the study here in the book of Matthew chapter seven. Because um, I, I, I wanna help prove um, that the apostle Paul is not just coming up with these concepts on his own. Uh, we, Probably a no-brainer to, to notate that. But I want to go back to Jesus Christ as the standard, Jesus Christ as that, that foundation. Uh, and let's notice here, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. He says, Judge not uh, that you be not judged. For what judgment you judge, uh, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Um, Jesus Christ, one of his main themes is this, this concept of judgment. Uh, not just immediate that day judgment, judgment within that sin, judgment within that action, uh, judgment as a consequence. Uh, we know that there's also a later end of life judgment as well. Uh, there's a great white throne judgment period that the Bible uh, prophesies about. So whether we're talking about uh, uh, end time judgment or if we're talking about in this life type judgments, um, this concept of judging is something Jesus Christ discusses a, a, a great deal uh, and covers uh, in many different ways. So the Apostle Paul, when he begins uh, talking about judgment to, um, to the church members there in, in, uh, in Rome, 
Uh, he's not sort of coming up with his own thoughts. Uh, he's not coming up with his own idea and saying, hmm, what about I should write to them? Oh, I think I should write to them about, <laughs> about judgment. Um, let's turn to John chapter 7, uh, and, and we'll see here another example of uh, how Jesus Christ was in and out of this topic of, of proper judgment uh, throughout his ministry. Uh, John chapter 7 and verse 24, he writes, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Uh, and this verse is sort of our springboard, uh, if you will, back into the book of Romans, because this is what the Jews were not doing. The Jews were not following this, this statement. The Jews were not following this, um, the, this, this command by Jesus Christ. They would judge according to appearance. They would not judge with righteous judgment. They would judge themselves uh, as righteous and then they would end up pegging their, their Gentile friend um, to, to a, 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 a different level of, of standards. Um, and so with this now, let's go to the book of Romans chapter 2. And we'll begin reading here in verse 1. Paul says, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. Uh, now, again, let's remember that we're coming right off the heels of some very strong language at the end of chapter 1. Uh, right? You're, you're filled with, with these things. Uh, God has given you, you um, given some over to a debased mind to do those things that which are not fitting. Right? There's uh, covetousness and maliciousness and strife and deceit and violence and boasters. And, right, there, there's this list of actions. Uh, and so Paul is following immediately up with, with those statements, those pointed statements and saying, you Jews, you are inexcusable. Right? You are inexcusable because you're judging another in a way that you yourself are not judging. Um, Paul here in verse 1 of chapter 2, the, the word judge here means to condemn. Uh, he's not talking about making judgments uh, or not deciding what's right or wrong. Um, Paul's teaching about judgment here harmonizes what Jesus Christ taught. Uh, and again, it's a continuity of, of this, this topic of, of judging. Uh, scripture obviously forbids uh, hypocritical judging, uh, judging for some sort of uh, condemnation, um, where we sort of place a judgment, we, we sort of place condemnation uh, on someone, we, we acknowledge their acts, something they said, something they did, whatever it is, um, and, and we, we pass sort of a condemning type judgment against them. This is not what Paul here is supporting. Uh, it's not our place to stand in condemnation of others, um, but righteous judgment, though, has to be part of every Christian's life. Uh, you and I have to exercise righteous judgment, not a judgment that, that condemns, not a, a type of judgment that, um, where we decide whether a person should, should receive eternal life or even physical life. Um, that's not the kind of judgment uh, that, that you and I should be making, but we should be, be relatively comfortable with making righteous judgments. Uh, and so, as we get into this topic of judgments here in this first section of Romans chapter 2, we have to realize that there are two main types of judgments. One, there's a judgment that condemns, and number two, there's a type of judgment uh, that determines right from wrong. Uh, so, throughout the Bible, all kinds of judgments are coming down into two, the one, one of these two main uh, categories. Um, the, the judgment that condemns shouldn't be something that, that, that we are doing. Um, this is a, a type of judgment that's reserved for the, the God family. Um, but that level of judgment that determines right from wrong, you and I should be all over this uh, each and every day. Uh, as we look at things, as we see things, as thoughts come into our mind, uh, as our hands begin to pick up and do something, uh, we, we should have this level of judgment where we sit back and we sort of judge ourselves and say, hmm, no, I don't think I should be doing that or I don't think I should be saying that or, oops, that came out. <laughs> uh, those words came out and those words were hurtful. 
uh, I'm going to judge myself now and judge that what I just said was not correct, was not, was not appropriate. Um, again, here in verse 2, we, we see uh, the, the members with this concept of uh, judging other people to a stricter level than, than where they were. Um, Paul makes the statement, for, uh, for you who judge, practice the same things. Uh, it doesn't mean that, they're, they're, that those condemning are making the same sin. Uh, oh, I saw you throw a stone, and so, you know, don't mind me throwing stones. Um, what, what Paul is saying here is that they're thinking and living essentially the same basic way. Uh, what's, what's reflected may look differently between person A and person B, between Jew A and Gentile B. Um, but, but Paul is saying at, at, at the very basic level, both of you are, are sinning. Both of you are doing things that are against God's way of life. The Gentiles, because they're thinking, uh, had descended into various sins. Uh, but Paul here largely in chapter 2 is speaking to the Jews and he says because you're living the same way you really know better than the you you're, you really know better than the Gentiles. Uh, the Jews felt that they were because they had the Torah, they had the law, they had all the the, the, the forefathers and such. Uh, and Paul here is coming in and saying mm, not not so fast here guys, not so fast. Uh, notice verse 2 uh, but we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Uh, whether man rejects God's truth or not, God's judgment is always according to truth. Uh, you and I will judge based on convenience, circumstances, uh, knowledge, maybe ignorance in some cases. Um, but, but God judges according to truth. Uh, he judges according to all the facts. Uh, this maybe is some of the beef with certain... Uh, court systems around the world where different types of evidence can be introduced in, others are rejected. Uh, this is not the way God does. This is not how God makes judgments. Uh, God makes judgments according to truth, all truth, the whole truth. Um, and, and God doesn't, doesn't condone, doesn't tolerate uh, certain practices. Uh, and so the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. What are the such things? Well, you need to be referring back to just sentences before uh, at the end of uh, chapter one. Um, but he's also making reference here back to verse one of chapter two, where we have these, these individuals who are um, sort of not judging accurately. Uh, they're, they're judging themselves one way, very lightly, and judging harshly uh, the, other, the other person. Verse 3, do you think this, O oh man, you who judge uh, those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Right? So you're practicing the same things. You Jews are practicing the same things as the Gentiles. Uh, at the very basic level, both of you are practicing unrighteousness. Both of you are practicing sin. Uh, you're judging yourself okay because you're a Jew and you have all this Jewish history uh, behind you, this lineage. You're judging your Gentile counterpart uh, you know, multiple times more severe. Um, Paul comes in then in verse 3 and says, you're, you're practicing the same things. Right? Maybe you're not throwing stones like the Gentiles throwing stones, but you're, you're doing other things as well that, that, that are hurtful to others. Uh, and so do you think that you can practice these things and do the same as them, that you'll somehow escape the judgment of God, uh, that, that, that you will somehow, God will deem you as um, being more righteous than your Gentile counterpart? Paul here is appealing to the sinner's own thoughts. Is this how you think about this, you Jews, is the way sort of Paul is writing this. Is this, is this the way you're, you, 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 you consider this? You who are Jews, you're, you're, you're thinking this way, Paul says. You're, you're, you're thinking this way. Paul is telling them, he says, essentially, you think that you can bribe divine justice 
by speaking against the sin, by loudly speaking against sin. Uh, and, and you're slashing those who are, are guilty as if your identifying of their guilt will somehow atone your sins. Um, and, and, and this is what, what Paul is getting at here. And it's very important for us to consider that, that we sometimes don't get in the same boat. Do we oftentimes look at the other person and, and sort of loudly profess their sins and how what they're doing is against God's laws. And yet somewhere in the back of our mind think that by us calling them out that somehow we're able to, to make amends for, for our sins. Uh, the Jews here um, in these first few verses, the Jews were resting on their physical descent from Abraham. They had the rituals, they had the ceremonies, they had the temples, they had all these things. And, and these physical attributes, this physical lineage, felt that this sort of made them right with God uh, and to a certain degree gave them a pass uh, because they had this history and because they had this lineage that, that God was a little bit more lenient with them and sort of set them up in this position to where they could point out everybody else's challenges and sins, and yet God would look favorably on, on them just because they were of Jewish descent and just because they grew up with the Torah and they grew up with these rituals and such. Verse four, uh, do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Um, the, the Jews here felt that, that there was some sort of apparent uh, indifference that God was giving to sin um, because he was patient. Uh, the, the, the goal of God's patience, as we see here in verse 4, is to always lead a person toward change. Uh, God is not patient just because it seems like a nice quality to have. Right? God is patient because he wants that patience to ultimately lead to repentance. He wants that person to change. Um, let's not make the mistake to think that God's patience uh, or forbearance, as it's sometimes translated in our English Bibles, let's not make the mistake to think that God's patience is, is an endorsement of the wrong way that we are living. And, and sometimes we can get into this the, sort of this, this mode of thinking we, we, we take for granted God's patience and we, we think, okay, well, God hasn't corrected this. God hasn't changed the situation. Nobody has said anything. Therefore, maybe he's indifferent or, or maybe his patience is great, which it is. Um, but, but we can easily get lulled into the mindset where we, we start to, 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 to not want to change from that. And, and we sort of have this indifference of that sin. Uh, let's not confuse God's patience with an endorsement of living a wrong way of life. Uh, instead of being grateful for God's patience with us, um, in, that, in those moments, we, we tend to be astounded by his patience for others, don't we? Uh, sometimes we can take uh, the patience that he exhibits to us and, and we can kick back on our laurels and we can acknowledge that patience, but then wonder why he's giving such great patience to this person over here. Right? Why, is, why are they getting such a long leash, so to speak? Why, why is he so patient with them? Uh, verse 4, um, God shows us goodness and forbearance and long-suffering because he, he wants to bring us to repentance, uh, and he wants us to acknowledge that change is necessary uh, in our life. Verse 5, uh, but in accordance with your hardness, uh, and your impenitent heart, you're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation um, of the righteous judgment of God. So again, this is still within the context of judging. Uh, and so we still see Paul addressing these, this sort of dichotomy between what the Jews were doing, what the Gentiles were, were doing, and how these groups to a certain degree were sort of clashing because you had the Jews making these judgments outward against their Gentile brothers um, and, and, and judging in such a way that, that they were found uh, to be okay, uh, guiltless, you might say. 
Now, the word hardness here in verse 5 in the Greek means a callousness. Uh, you know, sometimes we get calluses uh, on our fingers. Um, if you play a stringed instrument, you get calluses on the ends of your, your fingers. If you work with your hands a lot outside, uh, you might get calluses on your hands and things from different tools and such. The, those things build up over time. Uh, and so the word that Paul uses here uh, in verse 5 is that over time you've become calloused. Right? It, it's not that you've done this one day and all of a sudden you have this, this hardness. No, those, those callous take time to, to develop, don't they? Uh, they? They just don't appear you know, by digging one hole over a course of a couple of hours. Um, this is something that, is, that has been developed. Uh, and so Paul here is calling this out that you, you've been this way for a while. Right, you've had this sort of callous approach toward your Gentile brother for a while. Um, here in verse five, he uses the word impenitent. Uh, impenitent. Uh, not sure the last time you used uh, impenitent in your in your daily language, uh, but the the word impenitent here in the Greek literally just means unrepentant. Um, unrepentant. So in accordance with your hardness. Your callousness, um, this callousness that's built up over time, your unrepentant heart, uh, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath. Uh, this is how Paul is, is laying out this verse. There's a callousness that's developed over time, and through that callousness, you now have a heart that is unrepentant, right? Because you're, you're judging yourself as being okay, uh, and, and, and this frustration you have from your Gentile brother is growing. Um, and, and so you've, you've allowed this, this hardness of heart against yourself, against being able to even see that God is working with you and, and things that you need to change. That, that, that has been hardened. It's been calloused over and to the point then that now your heart has become unrepentant. Unrepentant because you look at, the, this list of, of characteristics at the end of chapter one, and you're saying, nope, none of those are me. I'm, I'm good to go. Maybe my Gentile brother over there, can, can you read this section again a little louder for him? I don't think he quite heard, right? This is sort of the, 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 the mindset that the Jews were in here. Uh, and so in verse five, Paul continues to address this judgment concept um, and, and sort of trying to draw attention to to this, this hypocrisy that they have going on. And, and with that hypocrisy, it is developed here in verse five to the point that now they have this hardness that's developed over time, this callousness of, of, of what righteous judgment is and what, what true judgment is. And they've become unrepented uh, in their heart because they're, they're calloused against it. I, I have the Torah, I, I have all this Jewish history, Abraham's my, my, my father. Um, and, and so as a result, Paul says, eh, you're actually treasuring up for yourselves wrath in a day that you don't want wrath. <laughs> um, uh, wrath in a day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Right? Your, your, your day is coming. Your day is coming. This judgment uh, is different than the judgment here that Paul uh, is making back uh, in verse one. This, this judgment is that end time judgment. Um, when humans determine to reject their creator, God allows them to do so. Sin runs its, normal, its natural course. Uh, this was something we discussed in the last uh, the last study with chapter one, sin runs its course uh, and executes sort of its, its natural judgments. Um, let's, let's go back to the book of, of John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 48. Uh, John 12 verse 48, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him uh, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Uh, so this is what Paul is getting at here in, in uh, verse five, that there is coming this day of judgment where you might 
be calloused and you might have this unrepentant heart. You may think that you're doing okay and you're just surrounded by all these people that, that need to take a long, strong look at God's word. Um, but, but Paul is saying, mm, careful with that. You need to be exercising equal judgment back on yourself to ensure that you're in line with God's way of life. Uh, and so this judgment, that this righteous judgment of God, uh, the revel revelation of the righteous judgment of God that he talks about here at the end of verse 5 um, in, in Romans 2 is this end time judgment that uh, even Jesus spoke of um, here in John chapter 12. Uh, revelation 20 is another uh, citation that you can write down and read later, verses 11 through 15, Revelation 20. Uh, verses 11 through 15, those verses talk about how uh, the books were opened, uh, the small and great were judged. Do you remember this? Uh, from what was written within. Um, these books are open and judgment then is made out of those, uh, out of those books. Uh, and so this is what Paul is getting to uh, here in verse 5. Uh, verse 6, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Uh, he'll render to each one according to his deeds. Um, Paul is quoting a, a, a principle from the Old Testament. Um, you might have a, um, some margin notes with various scriptures and things. There, there's a lot of places that um, where this is sort of cited from. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 16. Let's read Jesus Christ's statement um, here of something similar, a similar statement. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, uh, in verse 27, uh, for the Son of Man will come into glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Uh, so Paul is citing principles from Jesus Christ, who's citing principles and things that are contained within the Old Testament in various places, but this is another reoccurring theme, this Exert this, this providing judgment according to their words or rendering judgment according to their deeds. Um, these, these phrases are, are, are very consistent through the Bible and even within Christ's own, own statements. Um, it's also sort of an interesting question if, uh, in regards here to verse 6, that if we're saved by faith alone, um, why would Paul need to make this statement? Uh, right, if we're saved by faith alone, which is sort of a modern nominal Christianity um, uh, adulteration of the Apostle Paul's teachings, um, but if this was what Paul truly taught, if he truly taught some sort of faith, um, sort of a faith alone, saved by faith alone type concept, then why quote this Old Testament principle? Why quote here in verse 6 that God will render to each one according to his deeds? Uh, if you're saved, you're saved, right? If, if you have faith, you have faith. It's sort of the beginning and end of it. And yet he says, hold on. Uh, if you're living, good. If, if you're not living according to God's way of life, then God's being patient with you so that you have time to come around and realize that and then be able to repent. That's back up to verse four. Um, and so the statement here in verse six is a very powerful statement sort of one, one nail uh, in, in the idea of uh, being saved by faith alone. Salvation, we know, is God's free gift. It's not, it's not any sort of reward uh, for our works. Um, and so some say our works are meaningless, um, but what Paul says is that your works, your deeds, uh, they are important. Um, it's not deeds alone, it's not faith alone. Uh, these two things pair together uh, and what Paul is trying to describe in the verses before that show this level of faith in God, show a need to change, show a need to acknowledge his patience, uh, the truth of who God is and what he's teaching, um, how that whole process leads to repentance. And verse six, then you have the deeds that are on top of it. Uh, so you have the faith, you have the deeds. Uh, this makes the whole Christian. Uh, as we'll see as we continue on through the uh, sections within the, the, the rest of the chapter here, um, we, we, we see this, the, the, this two-pronged two approach. It's not just the hearing, it's not just the believing, but there, the, there's this all-important doing component as well. Uh, and Paul 
uh, inserts that even here within his discussion specifically about, uh, about judgments. The expositor's commentary makes an interesting phrase. It says, profession doesn't take the place of production. Profession doesn't take the place of production. Uh, and so this is what Paul is getting at here in verse 6. Yes, to profess Christ is important. Yes, to believe. Yes, to acknowledge the patience of God. Yes, to even come to the point of repentance. Those are good things. Those are right things. But we also have to be a doer of the word. We actually have to, to put those things into practice, to practice righteousness. We, we can practice lots of things. We can practice things that are in the middle part of Romans chapter 1. We can practice things that are at the end of chapter 1 here in Romans. Uh, we can practice improper judgments as we, we see some of the Jews doing that here at the beginning of chapter 2. We can practice a, a, a whole host of things, but that unrighteous practice is not is not godly. It's that, that's to uh, get us to the point of of uh, treasuring up for ourselves wrath in the day of wrath. Um, the, the 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 doing here is important when it comes to the true Christian life. Uh, professing it doesn't take the place of living it. If we want to use that Spazer's commentary and sort of change the the words around, um, when it comes to the Christian life, professing it doesn't take the place of living it. Um, some of those Old Testament references here for, for uh, verse 6, uh, let me just give you a, uh, four of them here. You can read them later. Uh, Job 34, verse 11 um, is one place where it talks about rendering to each according to his deeds. Job 34, verse 11. Uh, Psalm 62, verse 12 is another one. Psalm 62, verse 12. Uh, and then two more, Proverbs 24, 12. Proverbs 24, 12. Uh, and Jeremiah 17.10, Jeremiah 17.10, on top of the Matthew 16 that we read earlier, um, that maybe will give you a start if you want to go back and see this concept, this phrase mentioned specifically in the Old Testament. Uh, verse 7, uh, eternal life to those who, are, who by patience and continuance and doing good um, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Uh, right, so... We have this hardness in verse 5, this unrepentant heart, they're treasuring up for themselves wrath, um, wrath that God, verse 6, will render uh, each one according to his deeds. Um, that, that judgment that God will render will either be that, that wrath uh, because of the hardness, because of the callousness, because of that unrepentant heart, or verse 7, the other option, uh, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good. Uh, this is what you and I should be striving for. Uh, this is, this is our, our, our marching orders, you might say. Um, th this is where we should be. Uh, Christians' works are not random, they're not sporadic, but eternal life is promised to those who are doing something. It's promised to those who are, who are seeking after something. Um, again, the verse here rejects the false idea that salvation is just about being saved. Uh, Paul is, is um, uh, not saying that. Uh, he's not saying that salvation is just about being, um, it, that, that salvation is just about believing, that if you just believe, then you'll be saved. No, uh, the Apostle Paul here makes clear, even in verse 7, that if we have a patient continuance in doing good, if we have a patient continuance in doing good, then there's eternal life, right? If we have an a impatient, um, sporadic, right, hardness that's calloused with an unrepentant heart, uh, well, then eternal life is not, is, is, is not for us then. Uh, verse, uh, continuing here in verse 7, um, in doing good, seek uh, for glory, honor, uh, and immortality. Notice that, that we have sort of our part, God's part here, right? God, God just isn't obligated to, to give immortality um, without us having this patient continuance in doing good, right? So that patient continuance in doing good, that's our part. That's our responsibility. This is something that, 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 that we are to be doing. God's part then 
is to give the glory, the honor, and eventually the immortality, right? This is God's aspect. And so here within verse seven, we can, we can sort of run this sentence on, um, but, but hopefully by, by pausing and examining this, we see that we have God's part, our part built in here. We can't give ourselves glory and honor we can't give ourselves those things. Uh, we, we don't give ourselves honor. Honor is given to us. We don't give ourselves immortality. Right? We're flesh and blow, bone. We, we can't even create something out of nothing, um, much less give ourselves uh, eternal life and immortality. And so these three things, the glory, honor, and immortality, these are gifts from God. These are things that, that he gives to those who do their part, which is the, earlier in the verse, this patient continuance of doing good, right? So we have our part, God's part. Uh, verse eight, uh, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation uh, and wrath, tribulation and anguish. Uh, and so here we have, we have the, the, the other option. So God will render to each one according to his deeds, right? That's sort of the overall statement. And then hanging off of that, we sort of have two, two different branches, if you will. You have some who will receive eternal life. Uh, and with eternal life, it's because they had a patient continuance in doing good. God then will respond to that with glory, honor, uh, immortality. Um, but then in verse eight, we see that other leg. We, we see that other leg of, of options. We can do it God's way, we can do it our way. Right? We, can, we can have a patient continuance in doing good, or we can be self-seeking, not obeying the truth, but rather obeying unrighteousness. Now the self-seeking here uh, ties very much in with the society that, that, that we live in. Um, they, they obey unrighteousness, they don't obey the truth, uh, they come up with their own truth. They, they half-baked the truth. Um, and so as a result, then there's indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish on every soul of man who does evil. Um, let's notice Second Timothy uh, it sort of puts this into some different words, but it's the same, the same concept. Second uh, Timothy chapter 3. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. This is verse 1, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, uh, unloving, and the list continues. Uh, this is the world we live in. Uh, and so back here in Romans chapter 2, um, we see the Apostle Paul at, at acknowledging this. Uh, this is one way that you could choose to live. Um, and for those, again, his audience here is sort of a mixed Jewish Gentile audience. He's saying, you gotta be careful. Some of you are going down this road where, where you're judging yourselves to be appropriate. And yet you, you're, you're on this track that's going to um, lead you not where you think that you want to be going. Uh, instead, you are obeying unrighteousness. You're not obeying the truth, verse 8. Um, truth here, in, as we sort of come into uh, the, the, the last few verses of um, this, segment, this segment on, on judging here in Romans chapter 2, uh, truth is more than just something to believe. And this is the point that Paul is trying to get across. You Jews, you, you, you have the truth. You, you understand the truth to a degree. You have access to the Torah. You, you grew up with these rituals, with these customs. Uh, you, you grew up a certain way of life. Uh, you can trace your lineage back to these really important people back in the Bible. Um, but truth is more than just something to believe. Truth, Paul is trying to explain here, is something that has to be obeyed. Truth has to be obeyed. 
we can't just believe in the truth. I, I can believe that the Sabbath is, is truth, um, but if I don't observe the Sabbath, if I don't keep the Sabbath, if I don't come before God during that holy convocation, then what, what good is that truth? Um, belief only is just belief. Uh, so Paul here is, is pleading with, with the church to say, be careful in your judgments. Right? Your, your judgments are not right. Uh, you're, you're, you're all over the board. You're holding yourself sort of righteous, um, but yet you're not. Uh, you're, you're, you're thankful for the patience for you, but yet you're not extending that to others. Uh, and so there should come a day, Paul is saying, when those actions will be rendered against, um, that, that judgment by God will be, will be rendered against you. And you think that you might be going down this one path of this, this patient continuance, um, but you got to be careful that you're actually going down this other path of self-seeking, you're not obeying the truth, you're obeying unrighteousness instead because you've had this truth as just something that, that you kind of put in your backpack. Uh, I'll, I'll take God's truth, uh, I'll take this, this precious calling that, that God has given and I'll kind of sort of put it in my pocket and I'll, I'll, I'll hold on to it. Um, Paul's saying, no, that's, that's not gonna cut it. That's not gonna cut it. Um, let's go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8. Uh, and flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do, do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This flaming fire taking vengeance is not a phrase that I want to have applied to me. Uh, and so if I take God's truth and I sort of tuck it in my backpack or I put it in my pocket in a, in a napkin. Now, all of a sudden, how do I obey that gospel? How do I obey it? How do I obey a level of truth that I only believe in? I mean, truth is more than just believing in it. Again, we can, we, we, we've already used the example of the Sabbath. We can pick any other number of examples of uh, food laws or keeping the festivals or um, you know, any of the Ten Commandments, if we take those and we only believe on them, yes, it's the truth of God, and yes, this is absolutely right, and yes, everybody needs to live by these commandments, and, and oh, the Sabbath, absolutely, and you know, food laws, absolutely, that's an eternal law, and those, those, those need to be acknowledged. But if we take that and it becomes just a point of belief, then we become no better than where we began tonight. Back up to verse one, you are excusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. Right? We judge according to the truth that we know, but yet we refuse to do the truth ourselves. This is, this is the challenge that Paul has here with the church at Rome. Right? This is where he's trying to get them to understand that that truth alone, belief in the truth alone, isn't isn't going to land them with, with um, e eternal life and glory and honor and immortality. It's simply not going to put them there. Uh, verse 9, uh, continuing in verse 9, of every soul who does evil, um, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Why the Jew first? Why the Jew first? Uh, the Jews have been given the truth first, and the Jews had the greatest opportunity to benefit from the, the, the knowledge of it. They came from a culture. Uh, they grew up in a culture that believed in the one true God. Uh, they had the scriptures. Uh, many of them had memorized much of the scriptures. They were given many benefits. Uh, and so this becomes then one of the great lessons here within the book of Romans. Without the spirit of God transforming the mind, truth alone will never be enough. Without God's spirit transforming our minds, 
without that calling from God that we know about over in John chapter 6 and verse 44, without the Spirit of God transforming the mind, truth alone will never be enough. Because without the Spirit of God transforming the mind, truth becomes subjective. Uh, it becomes something that we just believe. We take it, we package it, we put it on the shelf, we put it in the pocket. Right? It, it, it's never enough because that truth isn't something that we end up living. Even if that truth is based on science, if it's based on knowledge, philosophy, even if that truth is based on scripture, that truth is vitally important, but truth has to change us. If that truth doesn't change us, then it, it, it hasn't accomplished what it's there for. Truth is vitally important, but again, truth has to change the human heart. And what Paul is pleading with the church here uh, in this first section of Romans chapter two uh, is that we, we, we have the truth, but is it changing us? Or are we using simply the truth as this means to say, oh, look, that person over there is, is not doing what they should. And oh, let's see, how, how else can I evaluate this? Oh, look, that truth over there and that person over there, uh, this, is, this is what the Jews were doing. They were unexcusable, oh man, verse one. Uh, because they, they, they had this hypocritical style of judging uh, and they weren't taking that truth and turning around back on them saying, hmm, how do I need to change? And what do I need to do differently? Verse 10. Uh, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Uh, so here again, we have a fundamental teaching of the Old Testament, uh, the Jews again claim that God saw this, saw them as a as sort of the 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 favored nation because of the covenant relationship that they had with God in the early days. Uh, they again saw themselves as sort of being the the, the, the special child, the favored child, the the, the favorite nation. Um, Paul here begins to conclude this this section by saying. If you don't live it, then don't expect it. Right? If you don't live it, don't expect it. Glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works. Notice what is good. He's coming back to that action again. Take the truth, do something with it. Let the goodness of God, let his patience be a part of your life to the point then that you recognize that you need to change. Right? Because God has extended it, hasn't he? He's extended that calling beyond that Jewish nation. And now he's with the Gentiles, right? Now he has extended that special calling to the Gentiles. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 35 um, is a reference that you can read later. Acts 10, 34 through 35. Here it talks about how God is not partial, uh, that he loves all people. Uh, and so it's interesting that in verse 9 and 10, two different times, Paul talks about the fact that the truth was given to the Jew first, but now also to, to the Greek, uh, to the Gentile world. The Jews were mistaken in the idea that God favored them uh, and looked down upon everybody else. Uh, if we as Christians think this way, hopefully we don't, uh, then we would, we would be wrong. Uh, if we get the idea that God favors us, uh, this church, maybe even us individually, looks down on everyone else, uh, then we need to uh, be mindful of that, of that wrong attitude. Um, simply because we are receivers of his calling, uh, his kindness, uh, his benevolence, uh, his um, repentance, doesn't mean he's not working with others as well. Um, so again, verse 11 here, for there is no partiality with God. Uh, we can be thankful that, that God is working with others and he has called us. So with that, I think we will uh, conclude this, uh, this study. Um, we've gotten through the first section. We'll pick up the next section uh, about how uh, universal God's moral laws are. 
uh, and how he expects um, everyone to live to a certain standard. Uh, we can cover this uh, as part of our topic and discussion uh, for the next time. So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, we will uh, see you next time.